Okay. Well, welcome everybody to Tech Mom's Better Way Thursday. We're very fortunate to have Vanessa Quigley with us from Chatbooks, one of the founders, and that had an uh, amazing journey here that we're excited to hear about and learn from today. So thank you, Vanessa, for joining. We're wrapping up a lot of our programs for Tech Moms. We're coming up on two of our cohort graduations this next couple of weeks. So want to do a shout out and congratulations to all of those that have completed the program. And with that, we'll be heading into our summer months, but uh, picking back up in fall and, and Better Way Thursday uh, sessions will be continuing from there. So look forward to those. All of our sessions are always available on YouTube, on our, our channel, on our Tech Moms channel. So if you want to go back and look at any of those, feel free to do so. But we're, we're honored to have you here today, Vanessa. Thank you for joining us and uh, excited to get things kicked off. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and allow you to have the floor. Okay, well guys, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. There is a cool new feature in Zoom under advanced. It's a beta, it's a beta program, but it lets you do this really cool thing with your slides. And this is the first time I'm doing it in real life. Do you see the floating head here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am so excited to be here. I love the mission of Tech Moms. I had a very unconventional career path um, from going from a primarily stay-at-home mom to a tech entrepreneur. I, I kind of felt like that was a lonely path, but look at all of you here and I, you are my people. So I'm thrilled to, to share with you some of the things that I have learned along my journey and um, thrilled to, to support such an amazing organization and fun to work with Robin, even though she's not here today. Um, Robin and I go way back to BYU. We sing in concert choir together and I've loved seeing all the amazing things that she's doing for, for women in, in Utah. So thank you for inviting me to share a bit of my story. Um, I wanna start by going Back in time, 2016, um, I received a phone call letting me know that I was a finalist in the Women in Tech Awards. Now, I know, Trina, you have some history here. You know what I'm talking about. I was totally caught off guard because we had only been in business for about a year and a half. And I was flattered. Oh, me? A woman in tech? Finalist? An award? Okay, well... I don't know anything about this. Um, I immediately went to Google because that's where I go. When I don't know anything, I go to Google and I and I Googled the organization and what is this all about? And I read on the Women Tech Council website that the Women in Tech Awards are meant to highlight women who are driving innovation, who are leading technology companies and who are contributing to the technology economy. And I was like, cool. But that's not me. How, how can that be me? I, that's not what I'm doing. I did not feel comfortable with that role. I still was grappling with the fact that I was um, an entrepreneur in the first place. Um, so it was a that was a kind of a little rough a rough patch for me. And um, part of the part of the process as a finalist is you have interviews with other leaders in tech. And I was so stressed because I'm like, I don't even know what tech is like. I haven't been in this industry long enough to even talk about it. And so I actually went to lunch with our CTO and I'm like, okay, tell me about tech. Why is tech important? How do we use tech? Why would I, why would they ask me to, to be part of this program? Um, and I have no idea what I said in any of the interviews. Jumped to the punchline. I did not win. Um, all of these, wait, where is it over here? Everything's backwards here. These, these are the women on our team. Some of the women on our team that were able to come to that luncheon and some of the finalists over there. Um, but that was like the first big kind of out of body experience where I was like, who am I and what am I doing? Um, my husband told me something once as we first started the business that there's no one right way to be an entrepreneur. And that was comforting because I knew as a mother, there's no one right way to be a mother. There's no one right way to be a woman in tech. Like I'm learning all this as we're going and slowly and surely I'm becoming more comfortable with um, with the label of being a woman in tech. Although I will say it is kind of the joke around the house. <laughs> if ever I can't get Google, my Google home to listen to me or Siri ignores me or I can't get the TV 
uh, working properly, they're like, nice mom, you're a woman in tech, right? Um, it's kind of the joke around the house, but anyway, fast forward, this is a picture of my family. We just took this a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, for the first time, all of my kids were together. It had been about two and a half years since my oldest went to New Zealand uh, to get his PhD and um, we had this grand family reunion, but it's been eight years now since we started the business. And all along the way, I've learned things that have, I've learned things about the business that have made me com more comfortable in my role as a woman in tech and as an entrepreneur. But I've also learned that the things that I've learned while I've been raising my family here have translated into my new role as entrepreneur and um ultimately have like led to me i was awarded uh entrepreneur of the year in 2017. so those things that i've learned as i've been on my journey um and are the things that i want to share with you today those um those takeaways in fact even the idea for the company sparked from something from my motherhood um, I was a diehard scrapbooker when I had my first baby. That's my oldest right there holding the dog. Um, because I felt like that was an important job to be done to help hold on to the story of our family. And as the kids came and the way we used uh, our photos, um, transitioning to digital photography, I wasn't scrapbooking, I wasn't doing anything. Chapbooks actually was invented as a way to do this job, this mothering job that I took very seriously in the early days and kind of had fallen off the wagon. So even from the inception of the idea to start our company, it was all rooted in my job as mother. So um, let me share with you some of my takeaways. And these are, might be things that you have learned as well too, as you have um, transitioned from the role of mother into, into your career. Okay, let me skip to the next slide. Okay, this is the first takeaway learn from your mistakes. And I, I have to tell you, I'm the oldest of 12 kids. And when I went to college, I used to say, I've already changed a lifetime's worth of diapers. I don't even need to have kids. <laughs> I knew I would at one point, but that was the last thing on my radar. Um, but, you know, life throws surprises at you, right? Like you can have a plan for your life, but then things happen little, you know, speed bumps, pitfalls, whatever. Um, one of the big surprises for me was that I got pregnant two months after we got married and I was still in college. So I took on this role of motherhood a little sooner than I was expecting. And it turns out I really didn't know that much, even though I watched my mom, the mother of all mothers and helped her, you know, all the 18 years that I was before I went to college and before I got married and before I had my first baby. Um, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know and I had to learn from my mistakes. Okay. So there's a couple of pictures on this slide. This is my baby, my youngest, I mean, my oldest Calvin, he was my college baby. Um, two stories of mistakes that I learned, <clears throat> uh, Calvin, when he decided he was done nursing, he was done nursing and he just wanted to eat everything we were eating. And I didn't know you can't feed a baby everything that you're eating. I, I know that now that there are like, you should transition carefully to avoid, um, you know, allergies and stuff like that. But he was a hearty kid and he had quite the appetite. And some, a friend of mine had told me that her baby loved eating SpaghettiOs. I was like, oh, I bet Calvin will love that. That feels like an easy thing to eat. He actually didn't really like baby food. He just liked the food we were eating. So I was feeding him SpaghettiOs and he loved it. And I just kept going and going and going and going. And all of a sudden the can is like nearly empty. I was feeding him cold out of the can too. Like I seriously did not know what I was doing. Um, and then all of a sudden the tray here at his high chair was filled with the Cheerios. Like he totally just threw them all up. Like I, I learned the hard way that my baby is a goldfish and he will keep eating and eating and eating unless I set boundaries. I need to be more... I got to help him figure out when is enough is enough. Um, so that was one of the lessons I learned from Calvin. And actually, that was a lesson we had to keep reinforcing for, for many, many years. The kid had an appetite. Um, this is my daughter, Lakin. She's my oldest daughter. And she's a cutie. Um, but one night after I'd gotten all the kids up in bed, she started tiptoeing downstairs and peeking around the corner. I, I was happily on the couch with my husband watching Survivor. That was a kind of our routine. 
And she said, can I come sit with you? And I said, nope, go back to bed, not happening. Um, but my husband, who was a softy, said, okay, come on down just this once. Well, guess what? It wasn't just once. It was every single night for weeks and weeks and weeks. She tested the waters to see if that was going to happen. So I learned from her, you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. I'm going to set boundaries and I'm going to enforce them with love and kindness, but I'm not going to let these people in my life take advantage of me. So two of the mothering mistakes that I learned um, helped me be a better mother and help me with my, you know, subsequent children. Um, in the business, I also learned some mistakes. And here are a couple pictures of two of the first um, TV spots that I was invited to be a part of. But it was a little bit of a rocky road in the beginning because again, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I had, we were starting this business. My husband was working on the development side and I was working on marketing and I don't have a degree in marketing. I don't know anything about marketing, but you can learn a lot from Google. Um, and I Googled, how can I get press for a consumer app? And there were some of the things were like, oh, have um, reach out to magazine editors and newspaper editors and TV stations to see if you can get local coverage. So I did that. I sent lots of emails and a couple of friendly people came back. These were two of the invitations that I got to, to, to be on a show. But with one TV station, my request got channeled through their ad department. And I got a reply saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you can come on, but it'll cost, you know, $1,500. And I was like, oh, yeah, we have no budget for marketing. Yeah, that's that's not what I'm I mean. I actually have value to add. Like I'm going to I can share with your audience why your family memories are important and how um, new ways that you can hold on to your family story. Um, and so I reached out to a couple more people at that TV station. And anyway, long story short created quite the brouhaha and um i got a really uncomfortable email from one of the on hair on-air personalities accusing me of going around the system and how unprofessional it was and it was it was one of the harder moments of my career and i you know okay i guess there is a process and i and it wasn't trying to be shady it wasn't trying to like get away with anything but um thank you for teaching me i have learned my lesson and you know mistakes other mistakes were made, um, not with that TV station, um, but as we started working with influencer marketing, there are some um, there's some big personalities out there, and so learning how to deal with that, I, had, I made a couple of mistakes. Um, we made mistakes with our product development and some of the ideas that we thought were going to be good and that our customers would want, which turned out they didn't care about at all. Um, my point is, as a mother, I learned to you're going to make mistakes. There's no such thing as a perfect mom, right? Um, you're going to make mistakes, but you're going to learn from them. They're going to make you better and they're going to help you down the road later. And the same thing was happening from like day one of at Chatbooks that I was making mistakes, but I had the humility and the curiosity and um, the willingness to learn from them and become better. So first principle, learn from your mistakes. Okay. Second principle, culture is key. So when I first started working and entering the workplace, I heard a lot of people talking about culture and I really thought it was, um, oh, it's like what your office feels like. It's like, do you have a ping pong table? Do you have cater and lunches? Um, do you do casual Friday? Like I, that, that to me felt like culture. I thought that's what it was, but I realized it's not. And I immediately, immediately, got me thinking back to this point in my life when I was pregnant with baby number five. Um, culture is what it feels like to live and work in a place. And um, this right here is, see, I keep going the wrong way, our Quigley Creed. Let me tell you a story. So I was pregnant with baby number five and I was feeling a little overwhelmed right? We also had just gotten a puppy. So life was crazy. Kids were out of control. We had rules. We had um, schedules that we lived by. But I felt like base, the basics of human, <laughs> like being a good citizen were not being met in our home. And so it was actually my husband's idea to like, let's just write this down. Let's write down what it means to be a Quigley and 
we're just going to brainwash it into the kids. And so we came up with what we called the Quigley Creed. And this is actually what it evolved to over the years. Um, in the early days when the kids were little like this, it was Quigleys are kind, obedient, cheerful, and polite, right? The, the basics, just please be kind and cheerful and, and polite to me. And we would recite it with the kids every night before bed. Um, it didn't guarantee that they were always those things or behaved in that way, but it was an, an expected set of values that defined what it meant to be a Quigley and we referred to it often and things did get better. It was nice to have something to say, hey, was that kind? Look, Quigleys are kind. Anyway, as we started the business, um, we got some really good advice from Aaron Sconard, who's the CEO of Pluralsight. And he's like, think about culture, talk about what kind of culture you want, codify your culture, write it down and communicate it often. It's gonna be a guiding force as your company grows. And he gave us the book, um, The Advantage by Patrick Leoncini, which is all about this and organizational health and how having a really clearly defined culture is important. Um, and it all resonated with me because I had felt that in our family with our Quigley Creed. And so at the beginning of like the early days of our company, we took our small founding team and we sat down and we talked about what what do we want it to feel like to live and work at Chatbooks? Um, and we looked at some of the team members, like the people that we like to work with the most on our team, and we found things about them that we liked, like listed, actually we listed on a whiteboard all of the qualities of all of the favorite people that we um, worked with. And then we distilled them all down to these values right here, grown up, amazing, they ship, they ship stuff, um, they're optimistic and kind. And so this became the framework, the all-star framework for our for our chapbooks culture. Um, and, you know, we also like talk about different principles that are important to us and um, practices like, uh, you know, how we work and how we work together. All of these things are our culture and we talk about it often and it has made working at chapbooks feel like unique and distinct, just like it was different to be in the Quigley family because my kids would then go next door to our neighbor's house and they they did things very differently over there. Sometimes, you know, according to my kids, it was better over there. They had more fun over there. <laughs> um, but, you know, they knew what it was like, what was expected of them to be in the Quigley family. And at Chatbooks, we have created a culture that's very unique and distinct for us. And it, um, you know, it's not for everyone. And, but, it's what guides us as we recruit, as we hire, um, also as we make decisions to um, to offboard people or make a trade. Um, it's it is key, and I can't emphasize that enough. And I've as I've learned as we've been building the business, I've learned like how much knowing your culture and communicating your culture is important. Now, not everyone gets a chance to start their own business and create a culture from scratch. I mean, you're probably going to be interviewing um, at other companies to take a job. And so my advice would be really get to know the culture of that company. You want you don't want any surprises. I have a friend who's at a company right now who um, thought one thing, but it turns out it's very different. And there are like deep cultural differences that are making it really hard for her to work there. And yes, you can be the change, but my advice would be as you're looking for the right job, the right path for you, really look at the culture because it's going to impact and touch every single part of your experience at that job. Culture is key. Okay, my next point, um, take training seriously. Okay. Did I already say that I was the oldest of 12 kids? Okay, so I thought I knew... I thought I knew how to be a mom from watching my mom do everything, right? Um, but when that first baby came, I was like, oh, wait, actually, I don't know how to nurse. I don't know what to do through the middle of the night. I don't know how to to feed this baby. Clearly, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, a whole can of SpaghettiOs was not the right idea. Um, there were things that I didn't know and I needed, I needed to learn. And I turned to books like what to expect when you're expecting. That was one of the books that stayed on my nightstand until I got what to expect the first year and what to expect from the toddler. Um, there were books, I had mentors. 
there are lots of different resources for me to learn um, the things that I need to do to fill in the gaps. But I was grateful for my mom who taught me, there were some things that she did teach me. And um, there were, it was many, many years of her with 12 children before she ever had any hired help, like anyone to help with the house cleaning. So guess who did all the house cleaning? I will say I did most of it because after me, there were six boys, um, but all of us had responsibilities and she was really good at training us how to do those jobs. Like how do you clean a bathroom? These are the products. These are the steps. This is the order. Um, she took that training really seriously and I was really grateful for it because it was a huge blessing for me when I had my own home and um, my own family. Um, this is a picture of my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> and um, actually I have a lot of pictures like this in my camera roll. Whenever I see something like this, instead of uh, raging about it, I just take a picture and try to have you know a sense of humor. Um, I sprinkle these photos throughout our chat books as well as just a glimpse into reality. Um, this is after I told my daughter, she was asking to go out and I'm like, well, have you cleaned your room? Yep, okay. Well, then I come upstairs and I see this. Clearly she had not cleaned her room. But this is just a reminder that kids don't know what you expect from them if you don't teach them, right? Um, this is a picture, this is a document that I made when I was trying to teach my children how to clean a bathroom. Um, I typed up these instructions. I taped them on the wall. They, they could see, they could read, they could know the steps to clean a bathroom, but that wasn't enough. I had to do it with them multiple times. I had to um, spend time and effort and invest in their training so that they too could clean a bathroom. Um, I did the same thing with the laundry, how to load the dishwasher. My mom was a great example of how to train a child to do a job and I try to do the same. Now, again, this photo is proof that they don't always do what's expected of them, but they're children, right? Hopefully one day when they grow up and move out, they will have the skills to take care of their own home. Well, when we started chat books, um, I really didn't know what I was doing. Like I said, I was Googling for answers to things and calling my friends and looking for mentors and reading all of the books and listening to the podcasts. Um, but I found myself as we started hiring more people in our team growing, thinking, well, obviously everyone knows more than I, like I'm just gonna let them do their job. Like they they have more experience, they have more schooling. Um, but then it dawned on me that really, no, we do things in a unique way here, right? And our culture and talking about our culture was one part of it, but there was this training part of it that we needed to invest in. And I'm so grateful for, um, our HR director, Madison, she's been incredible. She's put together very detailed guides for onboarding, for um, transitioning to maternity and paternity lead, for uh, career development, coaches guides. Just like you saw that annoying <laughs> document about how to clean a bathroom that my kids all hated. Um, we try to be really clear and really specific about training in every step and stage of the business. And we, make it a priority. The way our team is structured, we've got coaches and we have players. So it's kind of like a little a little family, although I don't really like using the family analogy with a team at work because you can offboard people from your work team, but you can't from your family, even though sometimes you feel like you want to. Um, but that having a coach and a player feels a little bit like having children that you're responsible for and like teaching what is expected of them, how to do a good job, and then following up with Radical Candor. That's another book that we actually give that book to everyone on our team. We believe deeply in Radical Candor about caring deeply about someone and then being direct with them um, in helping them like develop these skills. And, uh, you know, there's no room in a family for, for you know, cruelty or um, being, you know, passive aggressive or even overly aggressive. Um, and there's no room for that at work either. So that was something that as we worked on training our team, um, I felt like, yeah, this is, I get this. This is kind of like when I was teaching, you know, 
Declan to load the dishwasher. It's gonna, it's gonna take time, but I'm gonna be kind about it. I'm not gonna lose my patience. Um, one of the values at Chatbooks in our all-star value framework is grown up, which is um, I think obvious to most people, but when we started building the business and growing the team, uh, that became, you know, became at the pinnacle, the tip of the star, because I'm working with children at home all day long. I don't need to come to work and deal with this. And one of the examples was um, going into the bathroom in our in our first office. You know, we had our own little bathroom in the office and I would go in the bathroom and the toilet paper would be empty. Someone used that bathroom and left the toilet paper roll empty. Guys, that is not very grown up, right? My children do that. Um, so anyway, knowing what kind of workplace you want and then taking the steps to make it happen a lot of that felt a lot like the things that I did as a mother um, and being training, being specific about the training and then following up with it and doing it with Randall, radical candor has um, been really, really helpful and important as our company has grown. Okay, know what matters most. So, <clears throat> When I went to college, I wanted to be an international opera singer. That's what I wanted. And I was sure that that was possible for me. I, I was doing really well in school and I won the singer of the year. And um, my teacher was, you know, telling me about all these opportunities to help me, help me move along that path. But then I had a baby, right? And all of a sudden what mattered most changed. I knew I wanted to be a mother. I always knew I wanted to be a mother. Um, and so with this new reality of having this little baby boy, uh, my priority shift and um, what mattered most was being a good mother and, and taking care of my children. And so I made sacrifices. And when I think about through some of the sacrifices I made as a mother, like the first one that comes to my mind is my body. Like literally as a mother, you sacrifice your body. Uh, my body was not ever the same after having my first baby. And after having seven, um, yeah, you sacrifice your body, you sacrifice a lot of sleep. I think about all the nights that I was up late um, sewing a Halloween costume or uh decorating for the birthday that was in the morning or trying to make a birthday cake that looked like a horse that was hard you guys that was before the internet like i, I couldn't google that um <clears throat> but there were sacrifices i made a lot of them involved sleep for my family because that's what mattered to me and i wanted i wanted to do that that's it mattered to me that my kids knew that they were a priority and that i loved them and that i was making time for them and the things that made me happy about motherhood, like I was willing to sacrifice and make investments in those things. Well, this is a picture of my family just from the last couple of weeks, actually. Actually, no, that was Valentine's Day because those are roses from Valentine's. Um, but my life now as a working mother is very different. I'm having to make a lot of other sacrifices, but remembering that these people are the most important to me helps keep me grounded and helps guide some of the decisions I'm making. This is actually a dinner that I made myself. I don't do that very often anymore. I used to make a home cooked meal every single night, but as a working mother, I don't cook as much as I used to. But whether we're having um, a pot of lentil soup that I made or DoorDash or <clears throat> frozen pizza, um, we try to gather the kids together as whoever we can um, every night for dinner. and. Right now I have, of my seven kids, four of them are living in my house right now. Um, two, two that are still in school. I have two of my adult children that are transitioning between apartments and stages of life. But every now and then we'll grab another kid that'll come home from college to visit. But having that time around the dinner table is so important. No one's allowed to have their phones. We go around the table, we share our highs and lows. It's an important bonding time. Um, and then also I love to play games. So I try to snag the kids every now and then to play cards or something, but you know, I don't do all the things that I used to. I don't volunteer at their schools. Did I mention I don't cook very often? <laughs> Actually, anything in my house that I don't personally need to do, I have hired out. I have a lot of helpers that come and, and help me manage the household and do a lot of 
a lot of things around the house. But um, remembering what matters most has been kind of the guiding light as I've made these choices. And this is a um, this was a moment. It was actually really kind of a cool moment. Inc. Magazine did a feature on the best cities for startups. And Salt Lake was named as number two, even though our office was based in Provo at the time, like people outside of Utah just clump it all together. Um, but being able to have my family all there for this shoot for this magazine was a big deal because we talk about being an all in family and, and what that means. That means that we will always be there for each other. We prioritize, prioritize our relationships one, with one another. And even as I've transitioned from mother into entrepreneur and um, business owner and working full time. I've worked really hard to make choices that let my kids know that our family is still number one and most important to me. And one of the ways that we've done that is we've included them in the journey. Like, I think for my kids, they feel ownership. Um, and, you know, I'm making sacrifices by not being able to you know, make the homemade Halloween costumes like I used to or whatever, <clears throat> but they're making sacrifices too. And they're doing it because they believe in the business that we're building. But I think they also see what it's doing for me. Like I'm learning and growing and being uncomfortable and sharing those experiences with them. This is what those dinner table conversations are. You know, why they're so important is as we go around and share our highs and lows, often it's like, oh my gosh, I had this really hard conversation at work or I got to do this really cool thing. And we had this amazing brainstorming session and, you know, sharing these things with my kids and them seeing me learn and grow. They, they're proud of that together. And so this was actually a fun chance to just get to be in a magazine together as a family and feel like we're doing this together as a family. This is what matters most and um you know cheering each other along as you know as we go along the journey and um it hasn't always been easy but it's it's been worth it and it's been fun to do together as a family um okay so i love the fact that it feels like this is a family business and we're doing it together um and I love that the products that we sell and the services that we offer are strengthening families. That's our mission. That's guided everything that we've done since day one as we as we continue to grow. But it's also been a focus internally um, because we have 175 families that work for us. I mean, 70, 175 people that work for us, but they're not they're not lone rangers. They have, they all have families and we can't be oblivious to that. And I'll say that my husband's uh, first couple of businesses, they were not family focused, not in the mission of the business, but not in the culture or, you know, the, the way that the business worked. It was like business first. And I think part of that was because the teams were mostly guys and the business itself was pretty gritty but when we started chatbooks we were at a point where um you know family was the most important thing and we'd experienced what it was like to work uh you know to have a boss or a company that just didn't care like if you were your son's t-ball coach or if you your daughter had a you know a play performance that night like work was always first so when we built our company we made it focused on families on strengthening families um, inside and out. And these are some of the things that we, we have instituted, some of the policies, some of the benefits, some of the things that we do at Chatbooks that we think help strengthen families. Um, you know, my husband in all the years that I had babies never took, well, okay, maybe he took a day or the weekend off when I had a baby. But he certainly wasn't offered paternity leave to to stay home and and help me. Um, but maternity and paternity leave is something that we are able to offer at Chatbooks, and and I'm so grateful for that. Flexible working from home. We talk about everyone on our team giving eight amazing hours, but how and when you give those hours is flexible, and it's you know between you and your coach, you work out what what is the best arrangement for you. Um, and actually that 
that was in part came out of the upheaval that came with COVID. You know, COVID, we had to re-examine how we do a lot of things in life, but especially in our business, how we work. And we used to be an all work in the same office culture. Um, but, you know, I and we thought that that was the best way to do it. But COVID forced us to find a different way to work. And actually working remotely is my favorite. I love it. I love being in person with my team. I tried it every Tuesday, um, you know, actually go into the office, but I love working from home because it helps me be more productive. It helps me be more present with my family. So being flexible and being able to work from home has been a benefit to our team. Mandatory paid time off. That's also something that we offer because um, sometimes you have to unstring the bow. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes life can just keep coming at you so fast and so hard, especially as a parent, you're juggling home life and work life and you just need a break. And um, it's hard to take that time off. I, I, I think about all the years in my husband's career when he had two weeks of vacation and one week was always for scout camp because he was always a volunteer for um, in our church to, with the young men and he would have to take a week off to go camping with them. And then, you know, I wanted a week with him for Christmas. And so we didn't have a lot of time as a family to just like relax and reconnect. So mandatory pay time off. We every quarter require everyone on our team to take a week off. You don't have to go on some fancy vacation to Hawaii, but just de-stress, reconnect with your family. Uh, mental health is something we talk about a lot in our family as you know, several members of our family really struggle with their mental health, but also in our company, because we know we're not alone. Like mental health, um, issues with mental health touch every family. And so we all offer everyone on our team access to Tava mental health benefits where you get unlimited therapy sessions and access to um, psychiatry. And that's not only available for our team members, but also everyone on their family. Um, and also fully stocked bathrooms. I guess it's over there. No, it's over there. This is hard going opposite. Um, it was a no brainer for me when we opened the office that like, there are women that work here. We need toilet paper and tampons. Like that's what we always have had that in our house growing up. My girls' bathrooms, they've got all of their supplies. Um, it was a little bit of a shock of some of the guys in our, in our office at first, like what? my husband's like, what is going on? I'm like, no, this is, this is part of life. Well, um, having a fully stocked bathroom turns out that not everyone was doing that, but because as a mother and a woman, I was able to make that like, this is how we do things at chat books. And it's, it's caught on. In fact, the, my friends at the, um, the policy project have been working on getting products, uh, put in all of the public schools. And um, I don't know if you guys have seen all that, but it's they've been successful. They've passed legislation. All public schools are gonna start offering free period project, free period products, which is amazing. And now they're working on businesses for them all to come on board and recognize that this is like basic, put the stuff in the bathrooms, right? But not all businesses have women in executive roles and women leading out and making these things happen. So anyway, I'm just so, grateful that I was able to bring some of my unique experiences to a business to create a culture that strengthens families and helps us attract amazing team members. Um, we were just recently awarded the number one workplace for women by Fortune magazine for small to medium businesses. So the category was for anyone for less than a thousand employees. That's a lot of people. That, those are a lot of businesses. And the fact that we won number one was like, such a delight, but it was also kind of a goal of mine. You know, as we continued building the business, I knew that we were only going to be as good as our team was diverse. Um, actually, when I think back at the very, very early days of Chatbooks before it really, before we branded as Chatbooks and it turned into what it is today, my husband was building a solution for family memories on his own with like three other guys. And he spent a lot of our money, basically all of our savings, and a couple of years building the wrong thing because he didn't have diversity on his team. He needed different perspectives and different viewpoints. My husband's built his whole career building enterprise software, 
which is great if you are Pepsi and you need to stock all the convenience stores with your product. It's gr great if you are, you know, putting TV on airplanes, but he was not building what these women needed. This is a photo from one of our um, on sites a couple of years ago. Um, he needed a woman on his team to help direct the development of his product to be something that people really wanted. And so I knew that that's why I eventually joined the team because I knew he needed my voice. And I knew as we continued to grow, we needed to have parity in all of our leadership positions and we needed women's voices to be heard in diversity of all kinds um, on our team. So this was a super like amazing moment and probably the highlight, I will say the highlight of my career to be able to get this this award because this is not all about me but it's about all of the people that are on our team now and that hopefully will join our, our team one day because we continue to have big plans and dreams for chapbooks and hope to continue to grow and be here for a really long time okay you guys that went about faster than i thought it was going to be um but i wanted to leave you with a code here tech moms 20 is a code to use get 20% off anything from chat books. Um, we, we're trying, you know, okay, this is another thing I have to say that I've learned also as a mother is kids go through stages, right? Difficult stages. And you're like, oh, if we could just get through this, everything's going to be great. If I can just get them potty trained, then things are going to be great. Well, then the next thing happens or the next kid has a thing, or it's just like never ending. Do you ever have those thoughts where you're like, if I can just get through this and it's going to be great? Well, I should have been more prepared in this journey as entrepreneur to know that that was going to happen. But it always seems to shock me that like we get this big product launch and it's all going great. And then something happens and you got the next big problem or the next problem to solve. Um, those S curves, they talk about that in business. Those S curves are real. They keep linking. It happened all through family life. It continues to happen. Spoiler alert, if you guys don't have adult children, it doesn't get easier when they turn 18 or go to college or move out or get married. <laughs> Actually, bigger, the bigger the kids, the bigger the problems. Um, it's the same thing with the business. And so we keep learning and growing. And if you've ever used chapbooks before, um, we started by printing your Instagram. That was the aha moment that came to me that night with my, uh, when my son was like bawling, looking through a little photo album his preschool teacher had made him for graduation. I realized, oh my gosh, this is all he has to look back on. Like, I need, I need some, something else. Like, I got to figure this out. And so that idea to print my Instagram, which I'm never going to let my son get on and you know scroll through my Instagram to look back on his memories. But if I could print them in little books that he could hold on to, he'd have something more to look at. So that that's how the company got started. But I don't use Instagram the same way that I used to. Do you? Like nobody does. Instagram is not this fun, friendly place where you share, you know, personal, intimate things with your friends and family. It's like a marketplace. It's good for a lot of different things, but we had to quickly, you know, shift and try to answer the prop, you know, figure out the solution to that problem and figure out how is our product gonna gonna pivot. So anyway, the hero product now is not print your Instagram. It's amazing how many people still think that's what we do. You can if you want to, but we we do month books and this is a picture of a month book right there, a collaboration with Chris Loves Julia. Um, you pick 30 photos from your camera roll every month into a book and um, it's an ongoing subscription. And it's, you know, my kids aren't um, as young as they used to be. They don't sit for hours pouring through the photo books like they used to. I don't think I'm even doing it for them anymore. It's, I'm doing it for me because there's something about looking back through the past month and seeing, oh my gosh, because sometimes at the end of the month, at the end of the week, even at the end of the day, don't you sometimes feel like, <laughs> nothing worked the way it was supposed to like did i even accomplish anything where did the time go but there is a gratitude practice and looking back through the past month and selecting photos 30 photos that represent the ups and downs the highs and lows of what our family's been through and putting them in a book and being able to hold on to that to reflect on it even just put it on the bookshelf as a badge of honor of like look look what we've done 
Um, for me, that's what it's become. Month books are a gratitude practice for me. And if you haven't tried them, here's a chance for you to try Tech Moms 20. Um, hopefully, chaplooking will help you see the everyday magic in your busy life. And that's all I have to say okay. about that. Well, okay. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I've got, I have a couple questions from the chat yeah. that I want to make sure we get in. And the first one is, are you hiring? <laughs> so yes, we are that always we hiring. That one out. So if you go to chatbooks.com and scroll down to the bottom, that's our careers page. Um, we link all of our postings there and our needs change often. So if you don't see anything there now, um, keep coming back. And I'm going to try to be better about posting about that on my LinkedIn or wherever you guys want to follow me. If you guys want to follow me on LinkedIn, I'll make sure that we post new openings yeah. on LinkedIn so that you are aware of those. Wonderful. We had an, another great question, which I really appreciated your uh, discussion on diversity of thought. It's something that we we definitely preach the importance of getting these shared mindsets, you know, in changing the future of tech. And there was a question on how did you first insert your voice as your husband was starting this company? Yeah. How did you insert yourself and speak up and say, hey, I think I've got a better idea. How did that go? And was it well received? And, and how do you continue to have a voice there? That is such a good question. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing because you guys don't need to look at that anymore. Okay. My husband and I taught three sections of an entrepreneurship class at BYU yesterday. So basically we had to repeat everything three times. And it was interesting how we told our story the first time and then the second time it got a little deeper. By the third time, I'm like, I should have spoke up sooner because I didn't have the confidence when I saw him making decisions with our savings to build his solution to family memories I knew that's not really what I wanted, but I didn't have the confidence because I don't have the NBA. I don't have experience building a software company. I just, I wish that I had listened to my gut and spoke to, up sooner. Um, ultimately, you know, after moving our family from Florida to Utah, spending all of our savings and being in a desperate moment of like, what are we gonna do? Like we are running out of options. I was willing to say, perhaps you can build a way to print my Instagram. <laughs> And he was sufficiently humble in that moment to actually listen to me. And that is the catalyst that we needed to actually build a business that people cared about. So from that, I was like, oh, maybe what I think and it matters. Like maybe it, maybe I just need to speak up more. Um, there were a couple of little missed opportunities for me to um, offer my point of view or advice. Um, from the sidelines as he was starting to build the business. And that's when I ultimately decided to join the team so I could actually have a voice. Um, and it's been huge. I mean, it was still today, like I will be in an executive meeting and, um, you know, right now the other women on our team are on maternity leave. So it's just me and, and um, the rest of the guys on our executive team. And uh, they'll start going down one path. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I just have to say, I think we're missing something here. And I, you know, that's come, the confidence to do that has come with time and realizing that like it can make a difference or maybe it doesn't, but not speaking up is always the wrong answer. Like I'm always going to regret not speaking up. So with practice and then also with seeing the benefit that comes from it. I love, I love Liz has got her amen sign up. Thank you, Liz. Amen. Yeah, I the the I remember learning that early on in college too. Of like, hey, I think this could be a lot simpler, right? Like, kind of that, that hesitation, but then learning it's like, oh yeah, this could be really great. And and knowing that getting into environments where your voice is welcome and and learning to to fight through that hesitation, I think is so critical for for everyone that's on this call. So, and I will say couple, in in my own ahead. business and with my own team, like they know me and respect me. So I don't ever feel like they don't want to hear what I have to say, but I've been in plenty of meetings where the guys aren't even looking at me. And if I'm there with my husband, I will ask the question and they'll answer it to my husband. And so if we're together, he's really good about redirecting it back to me. But if I'm by myself and I start to feel that way, like it makes me so uncomfortable and it makes me realize like how many women are in organizations where they are not being respected. Like, so that goes back to my my comment about the culture. Like if you're looking to join a team, look for those things. Mm -hmm. And and be willing to say, hey, hey, 
Yeah. I, I was speaking or yeah. can you please, I've had to direct people to look at me before and, and call it out saying, Hey, I'm right here. I mean, that's Let's, scary, but it, yeah, you, it's part of what you have to do. Yeah. And I think the more you do it, especially in, in your environments, it uh, allows people to recognize you more and, and it starts to get easier, but it is hard. Yeah. But, you know, a critical part of, of building your career and being able to be heard and, and be seen even yeah. sometimes. There was uh, another couple questions that came in. So I'm, I'm loving this yeah. and that we've got a few more minutes so if we, can, we can answer some of these. Um, one of them, which I've, I've even had this in my career, the naysayers who thinks a mom's place is in the home. And uh, being able to address that, I don't know if you have thoughts regarding Oh, that. I do. Oh, I do have thoughts. And I will say my, um, I was raised believing that that was my place too. Like I, and I knew I wanted to be a mother. My mom, you know, she, bless her heart. I don't know how she could have done anything with, <laughs> with 12 kids other than what she was doing. Um, but she was talented and creative. She was an art major. She was always doing something with her talents. Um, painting, stained glass, basketry. Um, and sometimes she would write business plans just for fun, just to exercise that creative muscle. So I love to perform. I love to sing. I love to act. Um, as a, you know, I, I said, I wanted to be an, a, an international singer. I wanted to be a professional singer. Um, but I, I took that pivot from the big, the career track to, um, to be primarily a stay at home mom. But as soon as I got my feet under me and I was doing, you know, had some rhythm with the mom thing, I started auditioning and getting, putting myself out there because I felt like I would die inside if I couldn't tend to that part of me. Right. I, I knew I wanted to be a mom and I love being a mom and my kids were the most important thing to me, but I was more than a mom and this wasn't motherhood was not fulfilling every bit of me and wasn't helping me grow in ways that I knew were really important for my mental health. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. as soon as I started singing again, it was like, my husband was like, I feel like I have my wife back. I felt like I was a better mother. I felt like my mm -hmm. kids were happier. It just, I knew that's what I needed for me, but that's not the case for everybody. Like my, my best friend at the time, she was, you know, I was like, how, how are you doing this? Like how that seems so hard. Like, how can you, how can you possibly, you know, spend any time doing anything else? And she didn't quite get it because it wasn't a need for her. Um, so I say to the naysayers, like, well, this is just who I am. This, you know, there's no one right way to be a mother. Like there's no one right way to be a woman. And you just know what you need. And hopefully you have a partner that recognizes that too and supports that. Um, for you and then just do your own thing. You'll find your tribe. There are people like you out there. There are. We're all right here on this call and, and listening. So thank I you for it. your advice there. It's and I've I've had the same thing. It's just ignore the naysayers. I, yeah. you know, I'm gonna put it blunt. Like I've I've been writing and I've put ignore the stupid people because they yeah. exist and and they're it's gonna happen and you just ignore it. And well and I and, could make that Another bullet point on my presentation, because every mom knows that your kids will at some point say, I hate you. You're the worst, you know, even though you're not, it's just, and as a, as a business owner, like the channel on Slack that I do not ever look at, look at is our app store reviews because you will never please everybody. We have this feed right. that just brings in all of our app store reviews. And there are so many glowing five-star reviews. And every now and then there'll be that red one with one star, this app sucks. You know, and I, mm, my mama bear gets, gets me. And I get so <laughs> mad and I sometimes lose sight of the fact that like, you can't be everything for everyone. So that's a lesson that I'm still learning, but yeah, yeah that's a great reminder. A constant struggle, but it, I, I like that mindset of saying, you know what, this is something I can ignore and set to the side. And I'm going to focus on the people that do get me and yeah. do understand where I want to go. And I'm going to put my focus and energy there. Right. Yeah. And so it not getting caught up in it. One, one last question I, th I thought was really good. There was uh, Ellen on the call said, I'm a business owner and I have a question about marketing. Your marketing journey was so fun to hear because I've always viewed chat books as a marketing genius because of your ad spots from Harmon Brothers. How did you know it was the right move for your marketing at that time? 
Well, I will say, though I started off directing marketing and not knowing anything and literally learning everything from Google, I did know that I needed to hire somebody that knew more than I did. And I met a woman at um, Startfest. It was like the startup conference that now like spun into Silicon Slopes. Um, a woman was presenting there who had just moved to Utah from New York and had worked at Oprah Magazine. The minute she opened her mouth, I was like, we need her. Um, and we were able to hire her on our team. And so, um, yeah, well, we had, we knew that uh, we needed to educate people on our product because subscription photo books hadn't been a thing. And so we'd seen these Harmon brother ads and thought, oh my gosh, they would do such a good job with this. Um, but the price tag on getting yourself one of those ads was bigger than we could have ever imagined. And it just felt impossible. Um, mm -hmm. But we had proven um, product market fit. We were, you know, exceeding all of our expectations, um, decided to raise some money so that we could continue to fuel the business and then just took a, you know, leap of faith with the Harmer brothers on this ad. And it was a huge moment in the growth of our company. And I will say, um, a big part of that was just timing. Like at that time, this long form Facebook ad was favored by the algorithm. So we just enjoyed huge organic, um, you know, growth from that. Whereas we did a similar ad a couple of years later and it did nothing for us. <laughs> and it's not because it wasn't as, you know, clever enough or anything. It was just like mercy of the market forces on Instagram with their algorithm. Um, but I just, I knew that, I needed people to know why you need this product and we crafted the we crafted the script kind of about my real life that i knew would be relatable to moms everywhere so um yeah. i'm really grateful that that did well and and it's yeah it's still it's awesome and it, and lisa the the star of the ad she was a huge part of it because she's incredible everything she does is amazing so <laughs> Well, this has been wonderful and, and so appreciate your time and joining us today, Vanessa. It's been insightful for me and I'm sure for everybody on this call, we're truly grateful for you for spending time with us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for and, having me. Uh, and thanks for everybody for joining. We'll stop the recording from here.